Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining Tip in the Mint Watershed Council's A Guide to Water Resourcing Permitting webinar. Um, my name is Jennifer McKay. I am the policy director for Tip in the Mint Watershed Council. Um, I will be your host and one of your presenters today. Um, the other presenter who is here with us today is Jennifer Buchanan. She is the Associate Director at the Watershed Council. Um, I do want to apologize to everyone for having to reschedule the webinar. Um, I have pneumonia and uh, the original date would have not worked. You would have heard nothing but me coughing and it would not have been worthwhile nor enjoyable for either of us. Um, so I do apologize, um, and I do apologize also in advance if I have to start coughing um, as I'm still recovering. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera so you can focus on the presentation. Um, to begin with today, uh, I do have some housekeeping items. All attendees will be muted during today's webinar to avoid background noises. Uh, we will have question and answer uh, portion at the end of the presentation. You can submit questions throughout the webinar by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll go through the questions at the end and answer as many as we can. We'll do our best to answer all of the questions, but given time limitations, we may not be able to. And lastly, uh, we are recording today's webinar and it will be posted to our YouTube channel for viewing at a later date and it will be sent to all those that registered. For those of you that are not familiar with the Watershed Council, we're a nonprofit membership based organization with over 40 years of history protecting and improving water resources of northern Michigan. We protect, restore, and enhance our lakes, streams, wetlands, and groundwater through respected advocacy, innovative education, technically sound water quality monitoring, thorough research and restoration act actions, and we achieve our mission by empowering others, and we believe in the capacity to make a positive difference. We work locally, regionally, and throughout the Great Lakes Basin to achieve our goals. We were actually formed in 1979 by a coalition of lake associations and researchers at the University of Michigan Biostation, who pulled the resources together to create an organization that would be a voice for water resources in northern Michigan. Currently, we have 12 staff and hundreds of volunteers to work tirelessly to achieve our mission. One of the key responsibilities of the Watershed Council is to review and comment on permit applications within our service area, the watersheds within Antrim, Charlevoix, Sheboygan, and Emmett counties. We receive copies of all permit applications submitted to the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, EGLE, and to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or the Corps. And we receive those that are public noticed for projects that may impact water resources. Our goal is to avoid and minimize adverse impacts to wetlands, streams, shorelines, inland lakes, and the Great Lakes from those proposed projects. In 2020, we reviewed more than 100 permit applications and commented on 76% of them. Both state and federal regulations provide opportunities for the public to participate in the regulatory processes for water resources projects. Navigating through those various processes can often be quite overwhelming. And so hopefully today, through this webinar, will help you understand not only the laws, but how you too can effectively participate. State and federal laws exist to ensure the protection of water resources. The laws regulate activities such as development in the wetland, dredging or filling below the ordinary high water mark of an inland lake or stream, construction activities along the Great Lakes shoreline, and over 38,000 square miles of Great Lakes bottomlands, including our coastal marshes. This basically means that virtually all activities from seawalls and permanent docks to marinas and constructing home and wetlands require a permit. This 
image shows the various state laws that are administered by Eagles Water Resources Division. So we have part 303, that's the State Wetlands Protection Act. That's the primary law regulating activities in wetlands in Michigan. It requires a permit to fill, dredge, or remove soil from a wetland, construct, operate, or maintain a use in a wetland, or drain surface water from a wetland. Part 301 is the Inland Lakes and Stream Act, which requires permits to dredge, fill, or construct or place structures below the ordinary high water mark, or connect any waterway to an inland lake or stream. Part 325, the Great Lakes Submerged Lands Act, regulates construction activities along the Great Lakes shoreline and bottomlands. There's also sand dunes protection, dam safety, and floodplains management. As I mentioned, a variety of activities are regulated under these statutes. So everything from depositing or placing fill to excavation, to constructing buildings or structures such as boardwalks or pathways through wetlands or to get down to the lake, draining surface water, shoreline protection, and this includes everything from seawalls to riprap to bioengineering, uh, marinas and bridges and culverts, stream bank stabilization, boat wells, permanent docks and boat hoists, um, I will note the word permanent, as well as beach sanding. In 1984, the state was granted the authority to administer Section 404 of the Clean Water Act by the EPA for most waters of the state. So as a result, when a state permit is granted, it's technically a 404 Clean Water Act permit. However, the Corps of Engineers retained jurisdiction in Michigan on the Great Lakes connecting channels and rivers to federally determined navigable waters. The Corps also has authority under Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. It requires authorization for the construction of any structure in or over any navigable water in the United States. This law applies to any dredging or disposal of dredged materials, excavation, filling, rechanneling, or any other modification of a navigable water to the United States and applies to all structures from the smallest floating dock to the largest commercial undertaking. In these joint jurisdictional waters, permits are needed from both the Corps of Engineers and EGLE. One joint permit application is submitted, it's called a joint permit application, but each agency reviews the project and issues separate permits. So that means you can actually comment twice on one project. And if you do so, you'll wanna make sure you're referencing the laws that are applicable to each agency. So if you're submitting comments to the Army Corps of Engineers, you'll wanna reference section 404 of the Clean Water Act or section 10 of the Rivers Harbor Act. Versus if you're commenting to the state, you'll want to reference Part 303, the um, Wetlands Protection Act, or Part 301 of the Inland Lakes and Stream Act. There are three basic types of permit. Um, general permits are issued for categories, uh, for a category of activities that are similar in nature and have only minimal adverse individual or cumulative effect on the environment. So in our current program, uh, applications that fall under a general permit still undergo a full review and must meet all regulatory standards. However, they are processed um, by the department without a public notice and without a site inspection. Minor project permits are issued for those projects deemed to have a minor impact upon the aquatic resources. Minor projects still undergo the full review process, but again, are not subject to public notice. The Army Corps of Engineers has what are called nationwide and regional permits that are similar to the general and minor permit categories. For each of these, there is a list of categories um, for the activities that fall under each of these on the websites for the various agencies. I will send out a list of resources 
following the webinar and I will include those lists. Um, for individual permits, those are those activities that involve more than minimal impacts. Um, individual permits require public notice in which the public hearing may be held. It doesn't have to be, but it may be um, to give the public the opportunity to present additional views and opinions. Effective citizen engagement. Um, citizens are essential to the regulatory process. Wetlands and water resources simply can't speak for themselves. And therefore, there is a need for a public voice in decisions affecting the public. Public participation contributes to better decisions because those decision makers have more complete information in the form of additional facts, values, and perspectives obtained through that public input. In addition, not only do citizens provide valuable information, they also serve as a reminder to agency staff that the purpose of the regulations is to protect the public's interest in Michigan's water resources. So in this sense, public participation helps ensure that the regulatory staff are accountable to the public interest. So the first step in participating in water resources permitting is to obtain information regarding permit applications and public processes with opportunity for public comment. Um, most public notices, unfortunately, go unnoticed by the general public until it's too late. Um, but there are ways for you to become aware of public um, notices and permit applications. Eagle has an online permit tracking system. It's called My Waters. And um, on My Waters, you can access the Water Resources Division's permitting program, including public notice and public hearing listings. You can actually search active and past permit records, access permit applications, and report complaints. Um, it allows you to search for permit applications using criteria such as year, county, township, water body, the actual file number, and applicant name. Um, the link is there. Again, I'll send that out um, in the resources after this webinar. It does take a little bit of time to become used to, um, but once you do, it's a very valuable resource. In addition to My Waters, Eagle also has an interactive environmental calendar designed to provide timely information on decisions before the Office of the Director, proposed settlements on contested cases, administrative rule promulgation, but also public hearings, meetings, and comment deadlines. Um, you can subscribe to re receive these calendar updates via email, again at the link, which I'll send out. And just like the state, um, the core Detroit district has an online permit tracking system for public notices where you can request to be added to a electronic mailing list. And this allows you to receive public notices by email for select counties that you request. Um, in addition, Eagle can add lake associations, watershed councils, etc. Um, to the public notices. And so um, staff are assigned per county. Um, so for lake associations, watershed councils, um, you could contact Eagle permitting staff directly to request to be copied on the public notice. Um, and again, you do this by the county that um, you want to be included on. Um, I will share again this document in the follow up um, so you have it. Um, and again, I will also note that this document changes as staff changes. So I'll also share the link of where this document can be found. Um, the Watershed Council works actually quite collaboratively with lake associations on commenting on permit applications. Uh, some lake associations are quite engaged and lake associations can be extremely helpful as they're usually more familiar with either the applicant, the property, um, as well as the local municipalities that are or not 
and what they are or not doing with respect to the proposal. So it can be a mutually beneficial collaboration. Um, when lake associations reach out to me and want to become involved in the public process. If I'm contacted by a lake association or any member of the public, um, I'm always glad to walk through my analysis, share my comments, provide any guidance I can on the regulations um, and uh, the process. Um, that being said, any individual or consultant who is submitting an application is also encouraged to reach out to the Watershed Council prior to submitting their application. We'd much rather work on proposals and projects up front, providing our recommendations and suggestions for alternatives, um, rather than having to do so during the public comment period. Um, in the end, it can ultimately be a win-win for all parties. So assuming you've taken the steps to receive the public notice, um, there are important pieces of information contained in the public notice that you need to be aware of. Um, and these include the date the public notice was issued and the date that comments are due. Um, once the public notice is issued, the public generally has 20 days to submit written comments on the proposed project or request a public hearing. Um, the second is the application file or submission number. This is a number that should be included on any and all correspondence um, to make sure that the staff knows exactly what file you're commenting on. Um, the project location, obviously this is key so you know exactly what site you're looking at to evaluate any potential impacts and alternatives. Adjacent landowners, this will be actually provided in the permit application itself, um, but these individuals are often very helpful in providing more information about the site. Um, they're often directly impacted by a proposal. Um, and often are commenting themselves. The type and extent of activity, obviously this is critical when assessing um, project impacts. And then the purpose of the project activity. Um, so this is critical when determining if there are available alternatives. So Michigan statute uh, requires the following before permits can be issued. Um, basically, that a permit is in the public interest, that a pod project will not adversely impact the public trust or riparian rights or impair any waters or natural resources, that the proposed activity is wetland or water dependent, and that no feasible and prudent alternatives exist. Um, the same exists for um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so they follow what are called the Section 404B1 guidelines under the Clean Water Act, and they have the same determinations to issue a permit, um, that the project is the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative that the project will not cause or contribute to the violation of applicable state or federal laws. Um, so we're talking about state water quality standards or the Endangered Species Act, that the project will not result in significant degradation of the waters of the US, and that any appropriate and practical steps have been taken to minimize adverse impacts of the project. Put this all in simpler terms, <laughs> while each law has its own language and specific provisions, um, in general, all the statutes are designed so that the projects avoid and minimize potential impacts and mitigate for those impacts that do occur. So the first step always is to look if impacts can be avoided. Um, and if they cannot be avoided, can they be minimized? And then lastly, for those impacts that do occur, um, was mitigation proposed to compensate for the lost functions and values? 
At the same point in time, applicants are allowed to explain why mitigation is not necessary or not required for the impacts that occurred. So the effectiveness of your comments will depend basically on how relevant they are to the regulatory standards that the agency staff must apply. So in reviewing the public notices, there are three main questions um, you should always consider. And these questions effectively summarize the regulatory standards I just went through. So the first one is, is the project in the public interest? Two, will impacts to the aquatic resource be acceptable? And three, is the project dependent on being placed in a wetland or a water body? And does a feasible and prudent alternative exist? So we'll walk through each of these individually. Is the project in the public interest? So the degradation of wetlands and water resources harms the public by effectively eliminating the functions and values that those water bodies provide. And so when determining if a project is in the public interest, you want to consider basically the following questions. Is there a demonstrable need in the community for the project? Will the benefits of the project, the community outweigh the negative harm to the public? And to answer those questions, um, you want to consider a number of factors the relative extent of the public and private need for the project, the availability of feasible and prudent alternative locations and methods to accomplish the activity, and I'll talk about feasible and prudent alternatives, the extent and permanence of the beneficial or detrimental effects, the probable effects of each proposal in relation to cumulative effects, um, created by other existing or anticipated activities in the watershed. Um, you want to look at recognized historic, cultural, scenic, ecological, or recreational values, as well as public health, fish, and wildlife. Um, for wetlands, you want to look at the size of the wetland being considered, as well as the amount of remaining wetland. And then you also want to look at the economic value both public and private of the proposed land change. Will impacts to the aquatic resource be acceptable? To determine whether impacts to the aquatic resources are acceptable, the benefit which reasonably may be expected to accrue from the proposed proposal must be balanced against its reasonably foreseeable detriments. And so, there are many factors can be considered in this, um, including cumulative impacts, um, but you can look at economics, um, general environmental concerns, so wetlands, fish and wildlife values, floodplains, flood hazards, navigation, um, shoreline erosion, recreation, water quality, um, considerations of property ownership, um, and the general needs and welfare of people. When trying to assess, you know, what the disruption to the aquatic resource is, you know, there's some key questions. Um, what is the individual and cumulative impacts? Um, a big one to look at is endangered and threatened species. Um, is the area home to t and &E species or um, special concern? plants and animals? Um, have the impacts been minimized to the greatest extent possible? And will they be mitigated? Um, alternatives analysis. So if a project is not dependent upon being placed in a wetland or water resource, um, and a perfect example is peat mining. So peat mining cannot occur unless it occurs within a wetland. Um, then a less damaging alternative is presumed to exist. So, and by law, the applicant has the burden of proving that no alternative exists. However, I will tell you that um, oftentimes the alternative analysis provided by applicants is very superficial. And this is where local knowledge 
regarding alternatives can be extremely valuable and important. Um, local citizens, lake associations are familiar with the areas in question, and they may know more about alternatives such as available land or access sites that are not apparent to regulatory staff. Um, both the, the core and EGLE require alternative analyses and the agencies are not to approve a permit if an alternative is available. They do term it differently. So the core um, calls it a practicable alternative and EGLE terms it a feasible and prudent alternative. Uh, essentially though, it's the same thing. Um, common alternatives that we look at to minimize impacts. Um, the first is use of a different location. Um, and this can be either on site, such as an upland site, um, or it can actually be off site. Another one is looking at a different configuration or layout. So this can be as simple as removing the or reducing the number or size of lots. Um, another one is looking at actually reducing the actual footprint. Um, and so rather than doing a ranch style home, you can do a multi-story home that actually reduces the footprint on the ground. Um, or just reduction in overall scale of the project. Uh, another alternative is the method or technique of construction um, to minimize impacts. And um, I provided another a number of examples. So it could be installing an elevated boardwalk rather than um, a pathway that is fell. It could be constructing a home or a dock using helical pilings that avoid the amount of fill required. Uh, it could be utilizing shared driveway uh, that goes to multiple lots rather than each home having individual driveways. Could be, you know, constructing the engineered stormwater management system rather than discharging to the natural wetland. Um, there's a whole host of different techniques and methods, um, but the per in essence, they all achieve the purpose and goal of the project while minimizing the adverse impacts. So the next couple of images come from Eagle and highlight how um, alternative analyses work on the ground. So on the left, you can see an example of a proposed wetland fill for construction of a house on deck. And the red signifies the wetland fill that would occur under the original design. <clears throat> and on the right is an alternative in which the design and layout of the proposal is modified. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the right, the house is moved back with the placement of the garage to the left of it. But in this instance, there's no wetland fill needed, and yet the applicant can still construct the house and the dock as originally proposed, or as originally um, uh, what for the purpose. Likewise, here's a sample lot that is again proposed for construction of a house. And so on the left, you can see the way the house is proposed. There's fill for a wetland for both the home and a driveway access. Whereas by altering the design slightly, the project can occur um, for the right without the need for fill for the residents. Um, and then another example, um, here's a wetland crossing. Um, and as you can see, there are two examples, A and B. Um, so option A, the wetland fill goes across one of the longest portions of the wetland. Or you have option B, where wetland fill is at a more direct and short portion of the wetland. So obviously in this instance, option B 
would be the preferred option. And then you can also say, well, th there could be an option C, which would be an elevated structure. So in this instance, actually, the Watershed Council would recommend an elevated structure over the shortest and least amount of wetlands. <coughs> and the Watershed Council often recommends other types of activities that are less damaging. So for example, we see a ton of public notices and requests for seawalls and riprap's. Riprap. And in most of those instances, we'll actually recommend that the feasible and prudent alternative is bioengineering. And I won't go in, into detail um, because the other gen will, but bioengineering is a form of erosion control that incorporates um, biological, ecological, and engineering concepts to produce a living functioning shoreline system through the use of live and dead plant material and native soils and structural materials. And so natural shorelines provide a better alternative to hardened shorelines like the seawalls. And it also provides fish and wildlife habitat and water quality benefits that are lost to the other stabilization met methods. In addition to bioengineering, we also recommend that homes be moved back if possible. Um, moving a home back can compare favorably to other alternatives and actually prove to be economically, environmentally, and aesthetically better in the long run. So when you're taking action, um, written comments should always indicate the application or submission number and be addressed to the contact person in the public notice. Um, this will ensure that the comments will be considered for the appropriate application. Um, again, in general, you have 20 days to submit comments. There are some larger pro projects. Um, a perfect example would be the Enbridge Lend 5 tunnel project um, that automatically has a longer public comment period. When submitting written comments, you may choose to request a public hearing. Um, if a hearing is held, a written statement should be prepared in advance, and the major points of your statement should be presented at the hearing. Um, oral comments need to be concise and to the point because you generally have three to five minutes to provide your comments. You can leave your written statement um, or you can submit it separately as well. It's important to understand that public hearings also do have their shortcomings. Um, it arises from a disparity between agency staff obligations and sort of citizen expectations. So the technical purpose of a public hearing is for agencies to gather public comment on only those issues that are pertinent to the specific statute being implemented. And the public often requests a public hearing because they desire a public forum to discuss all aspects of a proposed project. And then they get frustrated when EGLE or the Corps does not answer their questions or consider relevant those comments that are not germane to the statute. So an alternative to this is to call for a public meeting um, in coordination with a public hearing, because this can provide the opportunity for you to discuss all issues related to the project as well. Um, some guidelines for commenting, be brief and objective. Um, state your opinion in a straightforward and objective manner. Um, identify your experience or organization if applicable. If you're commenting in your capacity as a professional, um, whatever that might be, or as an official representative of an organization, say so. Um, provide a brief overview of your organization and its interest in the matter. Be polite and respectful. Um, you know, those reviewing the comments are public servants tasked with the job and they deserve the same respect and professional treatment that you and other citizens expect in return. Be specific and relevant. Um, your comments should relate to the activity being proposed and should steer, state clearly the reason for your position. Uh, general comments that state in action will have significant environmental impact, in effects will not help the agency make a better decision. Um, you need to explain the relative cause and environmental effects. Um, it really can help if you can 
uh, cite or quote specific text to regulations that you're referring to. Um, if you can prove that they're applying the wrong standard or regulation, or if they made errors in data or calculations, if they are failing to comply with other state, federal, or local regulations. It helps if you can identify solutions um, or alternatives in particular. <coughs> um, those comments can be more effective than simply opposing the proposed project. Um, and then a couple things really to remember, um, commenting is not a form of voting. Um, so the number of negative comments an agency re receives does not prevent an action from moving forward. I know this has been frustrating on a number of big projects in the state lately, um, but that is just simply how the law works. And similarly, um, numerous comments that repeat the same message, so form letters or when you fill in um, a online petition, um, those are generally counted as one comment. And so it's really best if you can provide your individual comments rather than submitting those form letters. So when the Watershed Council um, submits our comments, most often we basically try to provide suggestions for measures that can be taken both in design and management to avoid or reduce adverse impacts to water resources. Um, so this mainly includes feasible and prudent alternatives, such as you know, minimizing the size of the footprint of the project or moving where a project occurs, um, utilizing a different technique. We often recommend the use of upland, bioengineering, elevated structures, seasonal floating docks rather than permanent docks. Um, we also will then recommend best management practices that can be added to a project to improve water quality or provide ecological benefits. This will include things like um, green belts or native plantings, as well as stormwater measures to address increases in impervious surfaces. <coughs> um, and then to ensure the permit meets the required criteria, we'll also recommend conditions um, to be included in the permit. And this can include a number of things from, you know, recommending that the project not occur during certain spawning windows, that turbidity curtains or other means to reduce sedimentation occur. Um, we also recommend that if equipment will be used in the water, that an invasive species management plan be required to ensure that invasive species are not introduced or further spread. Again, through all of these methods, we do intend um, to avoid and minimize impacts and really obtain a solution that achieves the applicant's goal while protecting the wetlands and water resources. Um, at the same time, there are some activities that have known scientific detrimental impacts to the health of our aquatic resources or have alternatives that have less impacts on our water resources. And because of that, um, these are activities that in general the Watershed Council opposes um, because they result in an unacceptable disruption to the aquatic resources and alternatives exist. Um, so, you know, in general, um, seawalls degrade the shoreline habitat, create native, uh, negative impacts to near shore aquatic habitat and species, as well as adjacent property owners. Um, beach sanding uh, is essentially accelerating um, the natural aging process of lakes um, and resulting in a lake's premature death. And in, in addition, the deposited sand can destroy um, spawning, nesting sites for fish, um, can clog their gills and interfere with their normal behavior. The suspended sand can also increase water temperatures, lower dissolved oxygen levels, um, reduce light penetration in the water column, and limit the growth of macrophytes. Um, shoreline management, which is the removal of vegetation along the shoreline, particularly um, coastal wetlands, has been known to cause um, chemical and physical changes in the nearshore waters, impacting 
um, larval fish, as well as invertebrate communities, um, and has been known to spread Phragmites. Um, permanent boat houses, um, you know, limit the ability of the shoreline to perform its vital function. Um, also increases impervious surfaces, and we know that studies have shown once an area around a waterway reaches 10 to 15 percent impervious surfaces water quality is greatly and noticeably reduced um boat houses uh permanent boat houses and other overwater structures also shade habitat preventing the sunlight from reaching the plants um, which limits the aquatic macrophytes and the benthic algae and phytoplankton which of course are the foundation of the aquatic food web. Um, the private boat basins um, are, are an issue because generally it can cause cumulative impacts where once one individual does it, um, other individuals want to do it, um, but also boat basins are created by altering, uh, by dredging um, and dredging can have a wide range of impacts um, from releasing toxic materials, damaging, destabilizing neighboring properties, allowing invasive species to become established and reducing water quality. Um, so um, at this point, I will stop and I will let Jen go into more detail about some of the um, alternatives and best management practices that we recommend. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Can you um, stop sharing your screen? Yes. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm the other Jen uh, that you're going to hear from today. My name is Jen Buchanan. I'm the Associate Director of the Tiffany Met Watershed Council. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to Jen for uh, giving us a very comprehensive overview of the permitting process and how to be more involved in the, in the process to help protect our lakes. Um, I'm going to start by just uh, encouraging you uh, who are listening in to check out the Watershed Council's website for more information about protecting water resources. You can see our website address is shown on this slide. Um, and in particular, if you go to resources and then publications download library, um, you'll find a number of things. Um, in particular, I want to call attention to our uh, book that was developed years ago, um, Understanding, Living With, and Controlling Shoreline Erosion. It's available as a PDF and details basically a lot of information about the processes that uh, lead to shoreline erosion, both natural and uh, um, man-made, and how property owners can address erosion with the use of what we call bioengineering or biotechnical erosion control. Uh, the image on the left is a project, the first project that the Watershed Council designed and implemented on Crooked Lake. Uh, the, this area had been mowed to the water's edge. Uh, There's a lot of boat traffic, so a lot of wave energy. And uh, Doug Fuller, longtime staff member of the Watershed Council, um, began uh, looking at the, the practices that could stabilize the shoreline, um, you know, with, our, uh, with natural methods. And so as a result of that, um, he developed and wrote, our, once again, our Understanding Living With and Controlling Shoreline Erosion book. Um, here, the image on the left has changed. That is the uh, current condition of that same project on Crooked Lake. It stopped mowing to the water's edge. Uh, the bioengineering project um, held and uh, the erosion has been abated since then. So what is bioengineering? Bioengineering is a system of restoring and stabilizing shorelines and stream banks 
Uh, and it uses a variety of techniques that include native plantings, soils, and other soft or flexible materials. When designed and installed properly, the function of shorelines and stream banks is restored. Bioengineering avoids what is considered the negative impacts of more traditional shoreline techniques, such as hardened seawalls or hardened structures like seawalls and bulkheads. So perhaps the most important part of any shoreline bioengineering project are the plants. So especially native plants, we're, we're big proponents of using native plants in these types of projects. Um, the collection of plants, uh, plantings, is known as a green belt. And the green belts, uh, the best green belts are composed of a variety of plant types, including trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants like grasses, perennials, sedges, and more. The diagram on the left illustrates just one aspect of why native plants are preferred over non-native plants. You can see on the left, we have some pretty common species like hydrangea and daylilies, and you can see their corresponding root depth goes down, you know, a couple, half a meter or so. On the other hand, native plant species, very drop seed, you're probably familiar with black-eyed Susans, and you look by comparison how much deeper those root systems go, so up to five meters in depth. So um, native plants offer a lot of benefits. Of course, there are the ecological benefits, but just the physical um, root structures themselves are one of the things that really help um, hold those shoreline soils in place. And also they help to encourage runoff from nearby upland areas to infiltrate into the ground. And they also filter out pollutants like sediments before they can reach the lake. So green belts are a very important part of any bioengineering project. And I hate to interrupt you, but we've had a couple comments that they that people cannot hear you very well. Um, I'm not sure how to rectify that. Uh, again, with my microphone situation, if I'm talking right here, does that help? Closer? I heard a yes. That does help if I'm right here. I heard a yes from a from, uh, attendee, so thank you. I, I apologize for this. I'm having some microphone issues, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to be, um, I'll try to address that. <clears throat> so um, I, this next image here, this next slide, is the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership. I just wanted to call attention um, to this group of which the Watershed Council is involved. Um, there, uh, this website address is available, you can see up top. Uh, one of the things that um, they have done uh, throughout the state of Michigan is to um, provide homeowners a lot of great information, but also they do a contractor training, so a shoreline contractor training program every year. And contractors that successfully go through that training are then receive the uh, certification. Um, and so that website there will list the contractors um, who have gone through that training and who are um, at least understand basically the principles of bioengineering or biotechnical erosion control. So I encourage you to look if you're considering a contractor please take a look at that website and make sure that um, any shoreline contractor you choose has hopefully gone through this bioengineering training. As well as down at the bottom right corner of the Watershed Council, we also have our YouTube video uh, channel. And so there are a lot of other great videos that can help um, expand upon what I'm talking about today. Okay, so getting into some of the more specific techniques of bioengineering. These are what we call coir logs, or also known as biologs. Biologs are a very effective tool in bioengineering practices. Coir is basically that 
stretching material from the outer husk of a coconut. Um, you have, may even have some of these uh, coir products in your home, like those uh, stretchy doormats. Um, so basically, coir logs are these, uh, made of these fibers packed densely into long cylindrical structures. They are biodegradable over about seven to 10 years. So they're not permanent, but they do last quite a few years. And they're almost uh, always, uh, most often used right along the shoreline uh, where they are served to protect vulnerable soils from further erosion. And they allow the plantings immediately behind them to become established and eventually colonize into that space occupied by the coir logs themselves. Here are uh, just two photos from a couple projects under construction here in Northern Michigan. On low energy lakes with typically a fetch, so an open water distance to a particular, where the wind can blow to a particular location, so with a, a fetch of less than one mile is often what we consider a low energy site. So not too many examples here in Northern Michigan, but in the Southern part of the state in smaller lakes, uh, coir, coir logs can be used um, just with plantings and, and nothing more. So uh, you can see the photo on the right is of a recently installed project with plantings immediately behind the coir log. And the detail on the left shows a typical application, once again, on a low energy site. But when here in Northern Michigan, uh, where most of our lakes are considered high energy, it's important to pair the coir log with field stone. So rounded glacial, basically rocks, um, not angular or quarried stones. Um, and this illustration basically shows a typical application of this technique and a few of the key components. So if you're considering a project or if you're um, considering a, commenting on a particular project, some of the things that you should look for if it's a bioengineering project are having a slope. So you see for every one vertical foot, the slope should be about um, there should be four feet of horizontal slope. So you can see that's pretty gentle slope. Anything steeper than that, and the bioengineering um, starts to lose maybe some of its uh, potential for success. The stone size in and of itself is really key and has to be basically determined on a site by site basis. The book I referenced on my first slide details how to determine what that rock size should be. There should be a variety of sizes. You don't want to go too big and you don't want to go too small. It really should be a mix of rock sizes, again, based on that particular site location. The coir elevation, so the coir log, again, this is the section. You can see basically where the water line would fall um, on the coir log, so about midpoint, maybe three quarters the height of the coir log. So that's another key thing. If it's a lake uh, that has a level control structure that should be taken into account or um, basically just where the ordinary high water mark may fall on that coir log. And then below um, the filter layer, oftentimes you'll see projects and they use a um, uh, non-woven geotextile, something that basically is uh, an underlayment and a, an artificial uh, layer underneath the entire structure to help prevent soil erosion. These get torn. Um, there are a lot of drawbacks uh, to using coir law or excuse me filter fabrics. So what we have determined over the years is you can have the same. Um, achieve the same result by using a mix of pea gravel and drain stone as kind of an underlayment layer. Again, this is all detailed in that um, shoreline erosion book. Okay, so the success of a bioengineering project depends on the design, but also the installation. 
There's a picture of a project installed on Elk Lake. Notice the installers are carefully placing the field stone to achieve proper configuration and slope. So this is midway, but you can see they're, they're being thoughtful about the placement of, of the materials. So it's important to avoid large voids in between the field stone, as these gaps can still allow for waves to pass through and erode shoreline soils. Here's another Northern Michigan project uh, where I want to point out a few key things. The smaller field stone on the top layer, they're basically acting as ball bearings as ice moves landward. So this gentle slope, so it's about a three on one to four on one, uh, coupled with the smaller field stone encourages this ice sheet to break at the toe of the slope rather than pushing directly at the shoreline, which oftentimes you get then that shoreline or ice burn as a result of that. So um, just another, another key thing. Also the organic material, you can see leaves and sticks have begun to kind of fill into the smaller spaces in between the field stone. That's a great thing because that's building soil. So over time, as this kind of fills in with organic material, you're going to have more plants be able to become established in here, which is going to further uh, fortify the shoreline. Uh, the next few slides, I'm just going to profile a, a few other projects. So uh, on Burt Lake, you can see uh, the fetch is six, over six and a half miles. Um, directed toward the shoreline here near Indian River. Um, using our formula, again, in that book, um, basically we had to uh, size the material so that, the, um, in this case, the, the rock was fairly large, um, but about 11 inches uh, for the average, down to about five and a half for the small, and the largest was upwards of 16 and a half. Here's the shoreline on the left hand side um, before construction. So there's uh, a lot of wave energy basically undermining um, a lot of the, the soils. There's some, um, root, obviously, some exposed roots um, on the right hand side, the coir log, some of the materials we began backfilling. Again, during construction, you can see in the foreground the gravel, so pea gravel and drainstone mix acting as that filter layer. We're begin, uh, beginning to um, come along on that far, far edge there with uh, the larger field stone and placing that along on top of the, the filter layer. And then once it's all done, we can see again that gentle slope and mix of rock sizes. Uh, the coir log is there, but is not visible at this point because the, the rocks, the field stone, have been brought to the, basically the top of that coir log. Another project here on Intermediate Lake in Northern Michigan. On the left-hand side, you can see the image with the existing uh, you know, prior to construction, there was a, a bit of a relic of a seawall that was um, deteriorating. And there's beginning to get some scalloped uh, shoreline behind it. Uh, so here, uh, the contractors are installing uh, the tow stone at the lowest most part of the slope um, and beginning to work their way toward the coir log as, as they're um, restoring the shoreline. Here it is, um, I think two seasons later, you can see the green belt has grown in uh, very well. The rock is still visible at this point on this side, uh, but you can also see by comparison, the neighbor with a hardened bulkhead seawall, the wave splash um, is pretty uh, apparent in um, the project where we did the uh, bioengineering, everything is getting, um, the waves are breaking further out from the shoreline. In the other side of that property, you can see actually a lot of sand has built up. So we're actually 
gaining ground or gaining shoreline through this part, through this technique. And one more here on Pickerel Lake um, in Emmett County. Uh, we did almost 100 feet. You can see they were mowing to the water's edge. They were using um, inches and feet of shoreline annually. I had the um, opportunity to work with the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership to host a contractor training workshop. Uh, so you can see, once again, we had a lot of fields down. The fetch was quite long and large, so there was a lot of wave energy. There's some um, regional contractors um, installing the project. It took uh, one day uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of effort among a uh, half dozen or, or a couple dozen folks, probably. Uh, these images are the same uh, location. You can see the water level went down, but the Coyer log is based basically at the ordinary high water mark. Um, this was after um, one or two seasons. You can see the organic material, which is starting to fill in all the spaces and voids between the field stone. On the right hand side, um, another season or two later, you can see the blue arrow indicates the top most part of the coir log. And then what has happened is all that organic material has filled in between the coir log and that rocky slope, and then a lot of plants have colonized. So we've basically built four to five uh, feet of land between the coir log and the water. So um, this has been a really uh, great success story. Um, these dashed lines show where the coir log was originally placed and where the tow stone originally, originally placed. So it looks much different than when it was initially installed. Uh, but we feel like the shoreline, we've again built land and we've restored the shoreline function as we had hoped. One more, um, one more um, example of bioengineering. Now this is on a river, so the Pigeon River, but this technique can be applied to uh, lake shores as appropriate. You can see the um, area had dramatically slumped um, in one event. So we used um, a Coyer product, uh, which is called BioD Block. It's a proprietary product made by the company Rolanka. And so on the right hand side, you can see the um, diagram or this dashed line shows kind of the basically profile of the slumped bank and how we intended to rebuild it. So the coir log, or excuse me, the bio-D block is um, composed of uh, coir, um, compressed coir fibers with these long, um, basically attached fabrics that extend back into the landscape. So you batter it or step it or tear it. Um, so it's useful in applications where you have quite a bit of elevation, you need to um, basically restore. So not a low profile like a typical shoreline, but if you have a high bank, this is a good alternative. Here it is on the left hand side after installation, there was some small field stone placed along the toe. Uh, but you can see these are basically these Again, these steps in between, we used a lot of native plantings, including dogwoods and nine bark. Um, they, they were installed uh, what we call bare roots, so not containerized. Um, and on the right hand side, that was the first spring after its fall installation. So things have started to colonize in between the layers. And difficult to see, but if you look closely at the core, you can see again that bio D block and all these shrubs have really taken off. And those are gonna be uh, key in holding that stream bank over the long term. And again, a little closer up, you can see that core fabric, but everything else is really starting to take a, get a foothold and um, it has uh, maintained uh, its structure in the 12 years since it's been installed. 
Okay, so not a bio engineering technique, but something um, that Jennifer mentioned earlier, where helical piers or helical piles or screw piles, they go by a number of different names. So just, uh, this is something that we often recommend people consider when they're um, doing any construction project, uh, whether it be a house or boardwalk or um, shed, something like that, in a wetland where traditional construction techniques may impact water resources. So typically best um, you know, for a wetland application. So you can see down below uh, the diagram, uh, the construction detail shows the general idea of what a helical pier is. It's more or less, uh, you know, a steel uh, uh, cylinder that has screws or threads on it and it's screwed into the ground. So the good thing about that is it eliminates the need for extensive excavation which would disturb potentially sensitive soils. It's a better alternative um, to poured concrete footings and foundations in wetlands. Um, it allows these structures to be slightly elevated off the ground, uh, which again is going to be important to minimize disturbance to sensitive areas and wetland soils. So there are a number of companies out there that um, are manufacturers, of helical piers and a number of companies that are um, skilled installers of these techniques. So uh, they also believe that it is not only better for the environment, but more cost effective. So if you're considering a, um, a construction project where soils may be sensitive, particularly wetlands, um, helical piers are a good thing, good alternative to consider. And then I uh, just want to mention, and, and Jennifer mentioned earlier, invasive species, the importance of um, any project to consider the, how to minimize the spread or introduction of any invasive species. Um, so shown here are a few local examples, actually. So the Japanese knotweed, on the left-hand side, that's growing near Wadley Lake Village, Eurasian water milfoil, uh, a purely aquatic invasive plant is uh, in Paradise Lake. Then you have purple loosestrife, which is uh, pretty, but uh, very much a, a nuisance to wetland environments. And Phragmites, uh, which is, you know, grows in wetland envir environments as well and will uh, choke out all native plants and has very little habitat uh, quality to it. So um, as far as the um, treatment options, you know, it's important to, uh, if a proposed project is in an area where invasive species like these or others are present, it's important to follow best management practices to reduce that, uh, to reduce the potential of, for them to spread to nearby areas. So uh, if they're present, the proper method of management, which can be mechanical, chemical, or biological, each species has a, has a best management alternative to consider. Um, so that treatment should be done prior to any construction. And all equipment that may be brought in, if it's shoreline or a wetland fill, should be certainly cleaned before and inspected prior to construction and after construction. These fragments of plants can spread um, very readily. And so any equipment that may be, again, introducing or carrying off site to the next location, a fragment of any one of these particular plants, uh, really to minimize the, that spread, that's a, that's a key thing of any contractor should consider. Okay, and lastly, this is my last slide. I want to call attention to one more resource. It's the Michigan Shoreland Stewards Program, which is an uh, educational uh, component of the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership. And it's designed for shoreline property owners to understand how to improve and practice their shoreland stewardship. So if you are already familiar uh, I've highlighted down there the Check It Out, uh, the website. 
I encourage you to visit the website and consider becoming a shoreline steward. So not only is there a wealth of information offered through this program, um, but I also believe if, if you just take a look, you're gonna understand, uh, you're, you're gonna improve your overall understanding of best management practices um, and allow you to be more informed as you consider any project on your own shoreland or perhaps um, as you're taking a look at uh, properties around your lake um, might help be insightful for how to weigh in on potential projects moving forward. So the Michigan Shoreland Stewards. And with that, I am done. Thank you, Jen. And with that, we will move to question and answer. And um, so as a reminder, um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Um, but we have gotten a number of questions. So we will start going through them. Um, the first one is how are cumulative impacts of activities associated with general and minor categories dealt with? And that's a fantastic question. So um, general minor permit categories are, um, are are redone every five years, um, at least. They are sometimes done sooner, um, but every five years they are put out for public notice and public comment. And so at that point in time, um, then everyone has the opportunity to evaluate and comment and assess not only cumulative impacts, but should those categories actually be general and minor permit categories or are they greater than those impacts um, and the watershed council actually does comment on all of those uh, categories every year well not every year every five years or whenever they come out so that's how they dealt with, or dealt with um, fantastic question um let's see jen uh, what happens to the void left as the queer logs decompose? So really over time as the queer logs are decomposing, which again is like a seven to tier, 10 year time frame, the plants again being the critical component, their root systems start to kind of fill in all those spaces. So as one is basically degrading, the other one is kind of filling in those, that space. So it kind of equal, equalizes out. There isn't end up ending up going to be a void. It's, it's one replacing the other. Okay. Another question. Are permits to fill wetlands ever denied? <laughs> Another great question. Um, the answer is yes, but rarely. Um, and I haven't checked um, recently what the um percentage percentage actually is but generally um the percentage is about um 96 97 percent of permits are approved um at least by eagle um that being said they are not all approved as um, submitted. So a lot of times there are those modifications with, for example, the recommendations that we make to minimize um, impacts or some of the alternatives. Um, but it is very rare for an actual permit to be denied. Um, usually it has to be pretty egregious. We've seen a lot of, um, Seawalls, we've seen some seawalls recently been denied, which is good. Um, Jen, where can you buy coir logs? That is a good question. And I'm continually trying to find um, suppliers. Um, I know that um, there's a vendor distributor in Traverse City. Um, uh, 
geo turf. So if you, if you um, Google is a quarter logs, um, there will be a number of folks, you know, regionally that will pop up. Um, their supplies are not always, from what I understand through contractors, their supplies are not always, you know, uh, they might be running low at different times and the prices do vary. You can also have them drop ship directly from a company like Rolanka. They're out of Georgia. So um, I do have, uh, maybe Jen, I can provide a, a list of potential suppliers to you from what, you know, my kind of recent uh, looking into it. And um, unfortunately, uh, unless I'm mistaken, there isn't anybody you know, within our service area that's uh, a provider, you would have to travel a little bit to get them. Thank you. Um, so there was a question about swales not connected to any lake or stream. Um, and so that's a very, that's a great question. So um, under part 303, uh, which is the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, the wetlands that are regulated by the state are those that are connected to one of the Great Lakes, um, which also includes Lake St. Clair. Uh, those that are located within a thousand feet of one of the Great Lakes, or again, Lake St. Clair, connected to an inland lake, pond, river, stream, are located with, within 500 feet of an inland lake, pond, river, stream, um, not connected to any of those water bodies, but more than five acres in size, um, or then if they are not connected to any of those water bodies and not five acres in size, um, Eagle has to make a determination that it's essential to the preservation of the state's natural resources and notifies the property owner. Um, and then local municipalities have the ability to regulate um, wetlands smaller. Um, so it's potential uh, there is a potential that a local municipality can regulate swales that are not connected to a lake or stream um, if it's smaller than five acres. Um, so great question. Um, another question. Uh, do you promote the use of large woody debris as habitat in your natural shoreline restoration design? And how does Eagle permit the use of large woody debris in these projects, as well as, quote, fish sticks habitat enhancement projects? So I can answer the first part of that. Um, we do encourage uh, the use of large woody debris where it's appropriate. Um, that's something I, I would love to see more property owners take advantage of um, because I think um, overall uh, too many um, near shore woody debris has been removed and that's to the detriment of our lakes. So we do encourage that. Um, again, site specific um, and where appropriate as a great addition to any shoreline or most shorelines. Jen, I can let you answer the remainder of that question. Um, uh, so they, they, they permit it. Um, I guess it depends on, um, you know, the, as far as what the project is and how it's being used. Um, but they do, they do permit it as part of restoration projects. Um, so we have a question about what good is getting a permit if there's no enforcement? Um, and that is a great question. So, um, Eagle has been under a lot of pressure lately 
with high waters, um, underfunding, um, overworked staff. Um, I'm not going to say that that doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing their job. Um, but it is frustrating. Um, and this particular person um, said there was not a turbidity current in place. And if that ever happens, um, and if it's in the watershed council service area, please let us know because we will call and um, certainly put pressure on staff to make sure a violation is um, or a stop work order is placed. Um, it is frustrating. Um, and so for that, I uh, currently the Eagle and Department of Natural Resources budget is being addressed um, by the legislature and it is um, being significantly cut. And so in order for Eagle to do their job, they need the funding and resources to be able to do it. Um, is there a requirement for an agricultural field to have a green buffer between it and a creek? And if so, what if the livestock need access to the creek for water? Um, there is not a requirement. Um, agricultural um, industries in Michigan are essentially exempt from a lot of Michigan's regulations. It is a recommended best management practice um, because we have um, significant nutrient pollution of our water resources, particularly in lower Michigan, which has led to the problems we've seen in Lake Erie um, and the, the dead zones and the algae um, that has led to Toledo not being able to drink their water resources. Um, so it's not required, but it certainly is a best management practice that the Watershed Council would recommend um, all agricultural industries um, do. Um, uh, who enforces rules about marinas and individual homes? <laughs> Um, that would be, um, if that would be local municipalities, um, as well as Eagle. Um, so if it qualified as a marina officially, um, that would be the local municipality and Eagle. And I would hope it wouldn't qualify, <laughs> but it might have. Um, there was another question about providing a written list of negative impacts of beach sanding. I did provide a link in the chat function um, if anyone is interested. Um, there were two questions about um, ponds. One being that um, if a pond is dried up for longer than five plus years, can it be repaired or expanded without a permit? Um, and I guess I don't know what is meant by repaired or expanded. Um, if it's dried up and they want to create a new pond, that would, that would require a permit. Um, because essentially it's the creation of a new pond. Um, the second question was a permit was denied. Um, and um, the homeowner um, let the pond go dry so we could do his work. And can you shed light on the thinking? And I, unfortunately, I cannot. Um, so, yeah, I unfortunately cannot speculate. Um, uh, 
Why are so many wetland fill proposals approved? That's a great question, given the, the essential functions and values. Um, wish I had a really good answer to this, and I don't. Um, especially, especially considering we've uh, adopted a no net loss policy. Um, again, um, Eagle and the Corps do minimize, do go through the avoid, minimize, and mitigate. And so the examples of the feasible and prudent alternatives, they do try and do. Um, but they are also bound by the laws that they have. Um, and so um, oftentimes they're stuck. And then if they um, do deny permits, they oftentimes get a, a legislator calling them very angry and trying to overrule the permit. Um, and so oftentimes we live in a political world rather than a realistic world that um, accepts the realities of um, uh, what should be. There was a question about what makes a marina. Um, what makes a marina is, um, and I apologize, you don't have the definition on hand. Um, it is actually um, how many docks and boats are at that location. Um, and it, it's in statute. Um, and I have your name and I can follow up with you. Um, but it's, there is a specific number um, that qualifies for a marina. Um, and, and at that, um, uh, we are at time. So, Jen, any last comments? Uh, no, I just want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. And I apologize about my audio again. Anybody um, have any other questions about bioengineering, uh, construction techniques, um, stormwater management, anything like that, feel free to reach out to me and I'm, I'm available. And, and likewise, um, uh, I'm available for additional follow-up questions on the permitting process. Um, we will get a list of resources together and send out to all those that attended. And I thank everyone for joining us today. I hope it was worthwhile and have a wonderful day. Thank you.